All right. So I well, hi everybody. It's Maureen. Um, can everybody see me all right? Yep. Okay. And you see my screen. Uh, so when Christy was talking about needing uh, someone to do, you know, the uh, <laughs> the second Monday in November, um, I don't know. I was like, what what could I do? And I don't know, I just like kind of mentioned field journaling because I've been doing a lot of it um, with kids, without kids. It's a lot of fun. And I thought, well, maybe I could share that because it's a it's really a good way for naturalists of all shapes and sizes and ages uh, to connect. And so that's what this presentation is all about. And not necessarily, you know, geared towards uh, working with kids, although certainly, um, you know, we'll throw in some ideas on that in that regard too. So uh, those of you watching, please feel free to comment. You don't have to, you know, wait till the end. Um, and uh, we'll we'll go from there. Okay, so let's go um, to a definition of phenomenal. So I, I use this word often, probably overuse it. But I liked what the dictionary said here. It's something that, you know, is very remarkable, extraordinary, and then perceptible by senses or through immediate experience. And that really wraps up this thing of when you're in nature and you want to capture your experience. And nature journaling does that in a, in a wonderful way. So I did have a situation that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I think every day we have phenomenon that we um, we explore and just are wowed um, by things going on. Last night, I put up the bird feeder finally with my son's help. And, you know, I looked around. There wasn't a bird in sight. Um, I saw a couple of eagles on on Veterans Day, which was really cool because I, I live uh, near Honeyoy Creek and they just kind of zoom up and down you near know, the creek. Um, but you know, with these feeders, I was like, I'm really late putting up my feeders and I, I don't think I'll get birds. Well, this morning, be between the hours of eight and nine, I'm looking at the kitchen window and in one hour, this is who was there. So why don't we as naturalists go around and um, and talk about these guys? I mean, seriously, all of, the, all of these birds showed up. So we've got, you know, our, what, nuthatch, cardinal, house sparrow, boo on these guys. They're already taking over my bluebird houses. Um, purple finches, chickadees, goldfinch, blue jays, juncos, tufted titmice. And then we had hairy woodpeckers, downy woodpeckers, and the red belly. And they were like just feasting. And it was just I don't know, I had a suet feeder, um, you know, a regular bird feeder, and then of course the squirrels came. So I don't know if I invited them in by, you know, just kind of wishing last night that they would show up, but I was just super amazed. So that was a phenomenon that I experienced this morning, and I just wanted to share that with you guys because it was really fun. So about this field journaling bit, um, this is nothing new, of course. Uh, most scientists keep some kind of journal, right? It could be um, about research you're doing, um, you know, from Darwin on up, but um, even with, even historically with cave paintings, people always wanted to capture what was going on in their lives with nature. And, you know, they told stories through this field journaling. Um, even this guy, Meriwether Lewis, right? Lewis and Clark, the trip, um, Jefferson demanded in no uncertain what words to make sure that you're journaling along the way. You're making maps, you are um, sketching species that you're discovering along the way. And of course, it's pretty text heavy, um, but that's what Meriwether was interested in doing. And he was quite prolific um, in terms of his art history too. Um, so you could you could mention all of these things um, but I think what I like to think about a lot is phenology, right? The passing of the seasons and what they bring, how they change, what you notice. Uh, and it's, it is quite remarkable. And every day we, we notice things, but we don't always record them. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty guilty of that too. 
So let's go on to my journaling kit. Um, and, I, and, and people ask, well, what, what do you carry around with you? Um, all you really need is a pencil and a notebook. I mean, I, I probably overkill with stuff, but if I'm going on, if I'm going on site, um, I'll take some colors. Like I, I, this is my travel watercolor kit. You don't need all these colors, obviously. Um, pretty much people get away with a cyan color, like manganese blue, um, a magenta color, like opera rose, oriole and yellow. And, you know, those are your three biggies and you can make any colors with those, right? And then maybe an indirect in blue, which is kind of like a gray blue and maybe a burnt sienna, right? But I get so into colors and um, I don't know, that's my kit. So usually what I do is I bring these guys, these are called water brushes and they work by having a little, um, cartridge in here that you fill with water and basically you squeeze them and the water comes out the end and the the brush is like a like a filament like a nylon tip filament um and, and you use them just like any other brushes but sometimes i'll bring my watercolor brushes if i you know if i feel like it um i i might bring a little pan if i need to get lots of color, like if I'm doing a wash, like a sky or something, you wanna get a big, huge puddle so you don't run out and then things get pretty wonky. Um, I bring paper towels, I bring a ruler. These guys are great. I get them on from Amazon. They're little plastic, centimeters on one side, inch on the other, but they also have these little um, grids, which, which are kind of fun to play with. I bring a towel, because I'm messy, and sloppy. I bring an exacto blade and scissors just in case I have to like take things off a tree or on um, a vine or whatever if I want to look at it more closely or even take it home with me for later. Um, I, I mean, as long as it's not something really super endangered like pink lady slippers or trilliums, um, you know, uh, anything else is okay. I made this. I can't say I made it. It's a T square, right? But I just sawed off one end of it. So if you want to make straight lines, you can make straight lines. And then I've got kneaded eraser and this like gum eraser guy, pencil sharpener, this um, blue pencil. Sometimes I'll sketch with it first. It's um it doesn't reproduce. So if you're going to copy something, that won't show up. And then I I have a couple of pencils. Um, I like to use an F and an HB not so much an HB soft, like a number two soft, that, that gets really smeary. But people, some people really like the smeary. So I'm gonna give the check. Oh, any way to turn off closed caption? I'm, let me see. Um, Adrian, somebody requested that because um, uh, um, some, some people would like the assistance for hearing. Oh, okay, all right. I, so it's not, it's not meant for me, right? Okay. Uh, oh yeah, getting back to the kit. So I like these Micron pens. They are waterproof and I go with the, there's a brown set and then a black set. Sometimes the CP is really, I don't know, it has a nice vibe to it, I suppose. Oh, this little guy is a, a pencil eraser. You you click on one end and a little eraser pops up on the other end. That's, that's kind of handy in the field. I don't bring all these colored pencils with me. That'd be crazy. I just like grab a few that I, I think I'm gonna need, um, but I just thought I'd put them there. And of course my notebooks. I have a um, my brown one, the little brown one is a multimedia paper, but it doesn't do really, really great if you're working super wet with, with watercolor. And so the one behind it is actually um, regular watercolor uh, pad. It's kind of cheap. It's not It's not like Arches or Fabiano paper, but um, it works pretty well, holds up. Okay, I think I covered it all. Okay, oh, there's a few more things. How come I can't, let me be, oh, there it is. Okay, so I also bring my little loop and that was really handy when I discovered Ilanthus trees on my property and had to show my husband how to identify them with those little glands at the at the leaf base. Um, yeah, so we had to get rid of those. Um, I carry a whistle with me just in case. 
I don't know. I can carry it all just in case I'm subbing PE. It comes in handy. Oh, and then, yeah, my compass. And I, I, I don't know. I, I find it useful. It has a little magnifier on it. It's got a little uh, measuring device on it. And um, you never know when you're going to need a compass. This thing I just sketched, it's a viewfinder, and I can't find it anywhere. I think I might have lent it to somebody. But it's a really cool thing. You uh, slide the piece of plastic in and out so you can change your um, your view, eight by ten, you know, uh, six by nine, square, more rectangle, and you hold it up. At, if you're doing like an outside um, landscape, and it'll help you focus in on on what you're seeing. So you know, I mean, outdoors, it's just so much, right? So it really helps narrow that view so that you can capture it on paper, and then. It all fits in this little bag. Now, some some people that do, um, they have this really cool like pouch and it's flat. I like to open it up so I can see everything. And so it came in a little in a kit with another big craftsman bag. And um, so I, my husband gave me this one. So oh, this is a really good find. This little this little um, stool bench. It actually collapses. So I throw that in with the. Uh, art supplies as well. And it, you know, you can throw it into a backpack. Um, I got it on Amazon and it's super sturdy. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, cell phones are good because sometimes you want to take a picture and you can draw from that late, late, later. There's no reason why you can't do that. Um, all right, so I always start with metadata. You know, you know meta means among, between, connecting. Um, I like the feeling of having a sense of space and, and and what's around me in the big picture. And you can really geek out on this stuff, but I take this, um, I actually put it into my journal, it's taped into the cover, and it just helps me remember of things that I might wanna point out, you know? Often I don't incorporate everything, um, but, but it helps. I always start with the day, like Saturday or Friday, or Sunday, and then the date. Don't forget the year. That's that's really critical. Um, sometimes we just like you know write. Oh, it's um, November fourteenth. Well, two years from now, you're going to forget. What was that last year? Was it two years ago? So always remember the day, day and date. Um, your location, GPS coordinates. Um, that's really fun if you're traveling. To get a sense of you know map reading, um, longitude, latitude, and start. And time, I usually put the start time. I always forget the end time. Um, the icon for cloud cover, I'm learning that right now. And I'll show you some stuff in a minute. Um, I'm really passionate about clouds. And I, I want to relearn all their names. I used to know that back in college. But, um, you know, you don't use it. You lose it. Sunrise and sunset, high and low temp. And then all these cool things, you know, wind direction, wind speed, the icons you can use. And then, of course, moon phases, uh, moon rise and, and moon set. So on my, I have an Android, so I use Luna SoCal um, for the sun and moon information. And the iPhone, I, I heard, I, I don't have an iPhone, but I heard the sun and moon app is really good for that. All right, so there it is inside the journal. And it uh, just helps me remember because, I don't know, I'm absorbed in, in the nature and I don't think I could remember all of that. At some point, maybe I will. So this is a page from uh, a little adventure we had as Master Naturalist at Camp Casa Wasco in Moravia. Remember that one? Right? It was that camp. It was like a Girl Scout camp or something. And we were doing invasive plants. And I came across this guy. It had the flower was nodding, like in other words, it was like down away from me, and actually that that turned out to be um, an ID characteristic. So I, I sketched it, filled it in, and then I got a flower and I actually put it in front of my face and said, "You can't, you can't not away from me." Um, and so I put some information on it. Okay, so getting back to um, clouds. Right, uh, learn from any kind of you know book, and then over here with the weather station uh, symbols, 
I'm starting to learn these guys, right? You know, uh, symbols for the clouds and symbols for wind speed, um, symbols for cloud coverage. And I think it might take me quite a while to learn all that, but I think it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and it'll, it'll just add to all that metadata. So this one's fun. I have this taped to the back of my journal and it's the um, Buford wind speed. I love the last one with number 12, a hurricane, pigs finally fly. Well, I'm, it's kind of cute, but I do use this with kids. Um, oh, for some of you, you may not know, but I work part-time at Coming Nature Center. Um, it's a great job. I do school programs. Sometimes I sub for a school. And, um, you know, there's nothing better than playing with kids in the woods. Anyhow, they, they can know this. They look at the tops of the trees. Um, they lick their finger and determine, you know, where the wind is coming from. And it's just another way of like, wow, this is movement. You know, we're, we're sitting in this really special place and there's a lot of atmosphere. There's a lot going on with weather. And um, I like them to participate in that. All right, with um, nature journaling or field journaling, a lot there's a lot of writing involved with it. And um, so it's not just sketching and identification of things, but I use prompts that I think will help people and me get started, right? And so what happens with, <laughs> what happens with, uh, you know, the first thing you notice about something or have questions about it, you have to engage with your brain. And that engagement is, is really, really critical for your observing. Because it's not just like looking, you actually have to learn to see things and asking questions. Um, not only is it very scientific, but it's, it's just something where you'll get a whole lot more out of the experience. So it can be cognitive. I think I notice. I wonder, um, it could be sensory, you know, what do I hear? What do I smell? Um, how do I feel about something? You know, did I hurt my knee going up that rocky cliff? I mean, all of these things can be incorporated in, in your field journal. Um, I, I do one activity with kids. It's called sound mapping. And what they make is they put themselves in the middle on their paper. And then, you know, as, as they think about the sounds from 10 feet away, 20 feet away, um, 50 feet away, atmospherically, you know, high up above the trees. Um, and they have to put in little icons or makeup sounds that they hear, bird songs, uh, frog croaking, um, a plane, might be a, a, a truck running by, but it, it, it forces them to uh, focus on their auditory sense. And that's a lot of, it's, it's a fun activity. So a lot of uh, field journaling can incorporate sounds as well as, and smells, right? You could do a field, uh, a smell sense map of things that you're experiencing. When I think about education, of course, um, I think Bloom, um, it's a psychologist that, you know, thought about how how we we have thinking skills, higher order thinking skills. And I think that field journaling really helps kids move to a to a more um, synthesis and evaluative phase uh, of of using their their brains. So not just remembering something or understanding, but you know, just putting things together again or breaking things up. Um, you know, when you when you look at a leaf and, and you're asking your questions about it, um, you know, how does it how does it incorporate into the ecology of the area? What things depend on it? That kind of thing is, um, you know, one of the one of the ways that uh, kids can start really ramping up the thinking process, and that's what we want, of of course, with our kids out there. Um, so. About sketching, 
there's there's something called the production effect. And I, I know this is going to sound strange, but if you're drawing something and you actually think out loud um, things that you're noticing about it, it'll hold better in your memory. And I don't know who coined the phrase production effect, but, um, you know, I first learned it from Jack um, your laws, who is an exceptional nature journaling teacher. And, uh, you know, I just thought that was interesting because I find myself doing it all the time. I just didn't know there was a name for it. Right. So if you're drawing animals, too, they're, you know, again, gestural. Just get gestures in. If the bird moves or if the animal moves, keep going. Right. Eventually, it might go back to that old posture and you can work on that that scene a little bit more in detail. So just stay with it. You know, it doesn't have to be this formidable art thing. You know, just, just loosely just capture what you're experiencing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you, you sketch, you write your observations right on the sketch um, because all that data is going to make it easier to identify something later on. And, uh, you know, I, I don't bring any field guides into you know wherever I'm going unless I absolutely know that well I'm going to go up to Lake Ontario and I'm going to be um you know looking at birds you know so I might bring a bird guide but um I remember there was time when I would just fill my backpack with field guides and just really not wanting to do that out in the field um it, or or not so much because I could always take what I what I drew, experience, and bring it home. And then, you know, in a more relaxed manner, you didn't have to worry about getting the books wet, um, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So size is important. Measurement is important. So field journaling brings in, you're talking about kids again, math skills, um, proportion, that kind of thing. So um, that's really fun. Um, we also do uh, magnification drawings, right? Microscopic drawings. I have a, I have a, I'm sorry, the, the, the cat's meowing and I just got to let it right. I'm so, I'm so sorry, but I was so distracted by her. Um, yeah, you're getting back to the stereo microscope and, and that's, that's a lot, of, that's a lot of fun too, you know, to get something really, really tiny and, 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 capture it um, in your journal. So we have a couple of things, maybe it's really simple, not an art lesson, um, but it helps to notice the negative shapes around what you're looking at. And again, a viewfinder is really nice for that because it, it kind of like, you, you could put it in the middle of a square and use those angles. So I, in this little thing here with the hand, the dark area is the negative space. And so if you draw the negative space, you actually draw the positive space. And it works so beautifully when your brain goes back and forth between the two of those. It really helps with proportion and accuracy. And then, you know, paying attention to the value in your drawing, like shading and that kind of thing, it, it, it really makes it um, so that things can pop out a little bit more. So this is a value scale. Light is light, dark is dark. So what you want to do is establish that. You can squint your eyes like in a landscape and say, okay, if I'm squinting, what's my darkest dark? What's my lightest? And what's the mid value? You know, and if you get those three things popped in, you're good to go. And of course, color, just have fun with it. All right. So I, I took a workshop on something called sketch noting. And it's it's really kind of cartoony. And um, I mean, this isn't an approach that I use in my journals, but I want to start. I want to start being a little more playful. And, you know, so the uh, the person that does the sketch noting, there's there's a whole that is a whole um, Facebook page on it. Uh, you know, there's and I can I can send out, you know, some things that, you know, uh, people can look into if they if they want to. Hang on, I'm just gonna check the chat real quick. Oh, okay, all right. Um, yeah, so if people like to cartoon, go for it. It's so much fun. I like the thing about the ideas. 
puzzle pieces, um, hitting the target, using arrows, right? Um, having fun with text and uh, layout. I think I have another one here. Yeah, so layout, linear, vertical, radial, right? You could put your object in the middle and then all your questions are around it. Um, here's a path, you know, of observations. Um, popcorn, you know, kind of says it. Uh, a modular approach, like sticking all sorts of stuff on one page, like kind of like a cartoon strip and frames, you know, I, I mentioned arrows, bullets, you know, so it is, uh, it looked really very, very fun. Um, ghosting, I, who knew, right? Uh, so anyway, just wanted to share that with you in case there's any cartoonists out there. All right, so uh, gosh, the mysteries. I don't know if anybody ever seen these before, but I, I had a group of kids out and their teachers with me and the kids like brought these things out of the woods and I had never seen them before in my life. They were the size of like large softballs. And so I brought them back to the center and uh, one staff member, you know, knew what they were, the little spelling thing there, but um, they're called Bomopsis skulls. How cool. And you could actually, if you could take a saw, right, um, and saw through them, they, they're they they're very woody. The, the tree actually makes makes these things, um, but they're, it's caused by a fungus. So my students sketched them and then we did some investigation about what they what they were. So sometimes and oftentimes you're not going to know these things until you, I don't know, explore and discover. So here's one mystery that I had. I had this tree growing on my property, little skinny little thing growing um, under a Norway spruce and a redbud. And I just, I just could not remember seeing anything like it. Now, again, I'm from New Jersey. I had to learn a few trees when I got up here, especially the poplars, but this thing was crazy. So I, I did dry press the leaf in a book um, it broke off, whatever, but I had it. And I happened to have an old dendrology book on, on my bookshelf. And lo and behold, I looked at it and it was like, oh my gosh, no wonder why I didn't know what it was. It's a European mountain ash. It's not Europe. Um, and so, of course, my question was like, how did it get here? Like, obviously, European mountain ash? Like, yeah, the birds could, I guess, you know do something with that. But my thinking is that it's probably from my neighbor because I learned that his parents, when they were alive, they had all sorts of really um, uh, fancy and unique plants um, on their property. And uh, I'll have to ask him about that. So what I did, I, I sketched the rest of it. You know, I, I taped it in and you can tape things in your journal. All right, that's fun. Just tape things like a leaf or whatever. Um, maybe not a soft bodied animal that wouldn't work so well, but it, I, again, I just kind of made this up the part that's sketched. Um, doubly sawtooth leaflets were the big giveaway. Wow, I was so excited! So, here's a couple of ones, and you can see I didn't do a very good job with my metadata. Um, I was with some kids, so really, I uh, again. <laughs> My attention is not always on what's in the woods. If I'm by myself, it's a whole different situation, but I got to, you know, be be on, be on the ball with these kids. Um, so a few sketches, Jack in the pulpit, you know, we were, we were in a, um, a Norway spruce woodland because um, at the nature center, a lot of plants were, trees were planted for the logging industry. So they're not all native. And then just, this is a, a, a brief thing about salamanders. Um, you can include quotes, you can include poetry, right? Things that you noticed. I, I, I put here, Annie Dillard said, how you spend your days is how you spend your life. And of course I was like, oh, I'm on my cell phone too much. So yeah, put in quotes of, of people that you love. Um, it's nice. And this one, yeah, I was, I had a plein air sketching workshop. I, I, you know, guy came to the nature center and I just kind of like, you know, walked by and said, 
oh boy, I, you know, I'll, I'll participate. And uh, so anyway, it was back in um, September and I just went into a field and, and drew some milkweed. I didn't get a chance to ask a lot of, a lot more questions, but I did get the temperature, right? And it all comes back to you when you do that. That's why the metadata is so important. You know, you look at this picture and like, wow, you know, it was, it, I remember it was warm because I was worried about getting sunburnt, right? Um, I always wear sunscreen, but you know, that stuff wears off. So yeah, it just brings back the experience. All righty. Well, I went to New Hampshire. Um, it was really nice. It was perfect timing with the fall leaves. And I went on a hike and I didn't know what this cone was. I um, imagined it was some kind of pine. So I threw it next to my handy ruler just to get an idea of how long it was. And um, I wanted to share a drawing hack with you because I didn't have much time. My husband wasn't interested in sitting around and watching me draw. So I threw everything in my backpack again. And later on, I drew the cone, but you're going to love this hack because what I did, I put the cone on my paper, right? And I put my pencil around the scales, just little dots, dot, 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 all the way around it. And then it helped me draw really fast. So I didn't have to worry too much about, you know, thinking about the shapes and everything. I already had them. It's like tracing. Wow. And then I filled in with, you know, a little bit of um, stippling. It's not done. You know, I need to get a lot more sepia in there. And of course, the most important thing, I still have to identify it. So anybody know what this is? It's a little over four inches. It's certainly not, it's not white pine. That Those, those suckers are really long. But um, anywho, maybe we could talk about that, you know, during the Q&A. All right, so this is where I was. It was like at the top of this um, beautiful overlook. And again, it was like it, it was like a two minute thing, you know, just sketch and then throw some color on and that's it. I did a much better job with the metadata on this one, right? Um, oh yeah, this is important too. You guys, are you suffering from this time change? Huh. Well, if you put this in your journal, It'll make you less crazy. Like, oh yeah, yeah, the day is decreasing. It's not, it's not all in my head, right? And I put in a little bit about wind speed. It was just a very lovely day. A little brisk, right? You know, it was 57 degrees. Um, but and it was a kind of overcast, but it was enough that we could see. And it was a beautiful, beautiful view. All right, so uh I opened my journal. I found this. I thought you would enjoy it. Um, yeah, keep your journal safe. So here's what I thought we could do. How's our time? Oh, we've got time. So if you want to go get a piece of paper and a pencil, and I'll tell you a little story. Hopefully, yeah, do you have something nearby you can just grab? You know, pencil. Piece of paper. Okay. So we're going to talk about praying mantises. Ah, here's the story. Well, I'll wait just a, a minute because I know everybody's rushing out to get your paper and pencil. It's going to be so much fun. Yeah. I learned something about praying mantises just the other day. So here's the story. So my son works on an organic farm and in the greenhouse, he uh, he found a praying mantis and he actually walked in the house with it on his shoulder. So praying mantises don't have any fear whatsoever of humans. Um, in fact, they, I don't know, they they want to crawl all over you. And uh, anyway, I, I really wanted to draw the praying mantis and I just didn't have time. I got really sick like over the past week or so on um, I don't know how, I hope your health is good, but I've been struggling with this virus and I, I didn't get a chance to, to sketch it. So what I did is I decided to research it anyway, 
this thing was that the ginormous Chinese mantis, right? And um, I didn't know this. I didn't know this, but it is very invasive. I I thought that they were beneficial. And I remember as a kid, and someone someone brought it up to me, like, yeah, 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 Maureen, don't you remember, you know, back in the 60s, there was like some kind of fine, like $50 fine if you, if you, you know, ran one over or you killed one. And I'm like, yeah, like who would ever police that, right? But I did remember learning about that. And so I'm laughing and everything. And then I decided to just like kind of look into this. So these big Chinese mantises can actually eat hummingbirds. And, you know, beneficial, beneficial pollinators, amphibians, reptiles, they're killers. Um, and they were brought over on purpose, right? They were brought over to help with the spongy moth, a.k.a. gypsy moth, a.k.a. Lymantria. And um, so we can see how that went. The European mantis, um, I've also seen that out in my yard, not recently but in summers past and those little guys are cute they're two inches long they're really bright green they're also invasive same thing um you know they outcompete the uh the only native that i know of in south in the south u.s is the carolina mantis they're not up here in new york state so far um maybe we can talk about that if anybody has more information on it uh but they are the, our native mantis in the u.s so what I learned is to destroy the egg cases, if you find them, um, of either the European or Chinese. I didn't get into it with, you know, putting different slides of what they look like. Um, you know, that's another that's another presentation. But the, the Chinese ones, they look like styrofoam. They look like shredded wheat almost. And, um, you know, they're about the size of golf balls, a little smaller. But... What I learned is that fish love them. If you have a fish tank, uh, you could burn them, put them in the trash, but um, you, you really don't want to proliferate the species too much. All right, so I had an opportunity to um, have this little guy, and I thought, well, I'm going to go to the pet store because I wanted to keep it alive. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I need to tell you, they die annually. So when when freezing comes, they're gone. They're all tropical species. So I figured oh, I'll go get some crickets, right? Keep it alive until I'm ready to draw it. It ignored the crickets. I have it in a really big terrarium. Um, and when I, I got a little nervous and I said, well, I'm going to feed it cat food. Let's see what happens. So you're going to see those mandibles working. Oh, dropped the piece. But what it does is that it starts chewing the food off of those spines on its legs. And you know what? Those legs hurt. If you startle one of these guys, it'll grab you and pinch you so hard you want to cry. Yes, it happened to me. But look at that. How fascinating, right? You see it going? And it really liked the cat food. Wow. Anyway, I thought that was fun, right? So what if we, together, because we're friends, oh, I want to keep going. Hang on. There we go. So now you've got two things to look at. And, oh, no, I can't get rid of the, all right, hold on. Hopefully everybody can see it now. So there's a close up. And, oh, yeah, yeah. If you look at the big the big picture, you could identify the Chinese one because they've got these stripes going down their face. And of course, they're really, really big. Right. They're over four inches long. And then this one, this is a Chinese one. They also have this beautiful green um, outer wing cover. Wow. So I thought we could sketch them. So why don't you choose one to sketch and then we'll share. All right, I'm gonna grab a pencil, erase well. Everybody ready? All right. I don't know which one should I do. Maybe the same one. Oh yeah, yeah. So on the um on the especially on the big one, look at all that blue, right? That is your negative space. So 
you could um, approximate that. Another thing you could do while you're sketching is, you know, to take take an idea about, well, all right, that that head, how big is that head? And then how many heads would fit in the thorax, for example? So I would say this is, this is where the, the thing comes in where you take a pencil, right? And you measure the head and then you go, OK, there's one, two, three heads can fit in that thorax pretty easily. So that's another way that you could, you know, get your accuracy going. You know, you just use your finger and a little pencil tip. And then, of course, there's antennae. It's a lot of fun. There's little mandibles. I like the big picture because look at those eyes, a little dot there. I don't know enough about the um, mantis morphology here, what that is. You know, uh, how, what kind of eyes do they have? I imagine they're compound, but I'm, uh, I'm a miss. I'm sure some of you are, you know, much better at all this entomology stuff. And uh, who doesn't love insects? Well, good, bad, and different. All right, how head, head, head. Okay, I've got the three heads in. Look at the, you know, the thing is too, what really got me going with this insect or the legs, they were fascinating. You know, they constantly moved, although it spends its days hanging upside down from the screen on top of the, um, on top of, the terrarium. And again, it wants nothing to do with all those crickets running around. Just wants cat food. Okay, so you're probably wondering, well, Miss Marine, what are you going to do with it? Um, I'm going to put it outside and let it freeze, let nature take its course. Some people will, you know, keep it indoors as a pet. Um, I'm not real interested in that. They usually die anyway. I mean, she's probably laid her eggs already and all that and ready to die. She's hanging around for little friskies or something. So when you're drawing, isn't it amazing how you know, the shapes all of a sudden make their way into your mind? Like the shape of that forearm, right? And all those little spiny things and the claw. Wow. That really hurt. So I'm getting it emotional here because I remember the pain. And then I got a little scared to put my hand in the cage. <laughs> so crazy. So I watched my son. It never did that to my son. And that's because he, he knows how to speak mantis. I think he just doesn't know how, you know, he doesn't startle it like I do. Speaks mantis. And then the other thing hanging down, those legs are crazy. And they all work. I mean. This thing is like a robot. There's constant robotic movement going on and so much fun. Okay, so I got that. Now, I don't know how you guys are doing. You guys doing all right? Having fun? No, Maureen, this is painful. I thought about having the um, praying mantis right here. And uh, then I got to thinking it'd get caught in my hair or something. Not that it would like really freak me out, but I didn't want it pinching me again. So yeah, plus it's invasive. So yeah, they're from China. I wonder if they're edible. See now, this is the thing, when you're drawing and sketching and taking your time, don't just start asking questions like that. Listen, the one, number one thing kids ask, can I eat it? Can I eat it? All right, and then, yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. But wow, that, that's a long body. And, and her abdomen is humongous. It's super crazy. How many heads can fit in that abdomen? Well, at this point, you can take the thorax and then add, ask yourself, okay, how many thoraxes can I fit? One, two and a half. Okay, I can do that. One, two and a half, whatever. 
invariably when you're, you know, sketching, you may be, you may be uh, distracted by something else and that's okay. No one's saying that you have to complete anything. It's not being graded. You know, and if you lose interest, you lose interest. You move on to something else. We know there's lots to get us uh, interested when we're outside in nature or inside. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I was doing, um, I was moderating this international conference on nature journaling this summer into September. And um, I, I was basically moderating breakout rooms. And one breakout room was I don't know, I never thought about this, but it was on accessibility. And the people in that breakout room had issues with being able to go outside, but yet wanted to partake in um, nature journaling. And, you know, it was anybody from like this woman who had really severe migraines um, to a man with uh, PTSD from um, Iraq, all sorts of issues. And they wound up, um, they wound up starting their own group. Um, so they would have support for each other. And it, it, it was it was amazing to me because I take so much for granted about my ability to go outside and, you know, and spend time. Um, and one lady, she's like, well, you know, I, I just feel really bad because, you know, I can't do things from life because even if I go outside and the wind is blowing, and the leaf is moving, it can set off a migraine. And I'm like, well, you can you can sketch from a picture. She's like, oh no, someone told me that's not nature journaling. And I, I was like, that is nature journaling. You can absolutely sketch from pictures. Look what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Oh my goodness, this abdomen is huge. Plus, they have this habit of raising their abdomen. I, I again, there's so many questions I have about these insects now. I'm um, kind of crazy. All right. So we have the insect. Oh, look at those little beautiful little underwings coming out on the bottom there. Can't see all the detail of the feet because it's on fabric. Right. I hope I hope some of you are drawing the um the big view. I'm drawing the uh, the other one. All right. Let me see on time. Hey, Christy, how are we doing on on the uh, Q and A? Can we should we stop at this point? Oh, I think we can keep going for a couple minutes. Okay. All right, that's fun. Uh, right. You may have to drag me out of this though, because once I get into something like this, <laughs> right? I'm not it's very so good at it, but I'm I'm no, it's this, by it at the moment. You know, again, here's the, and this is what I tell people it's not. Yeah, I guess you call it art, but it's about looking, seeing, and you know. Oh, also, okay, so I'm going to stop what I'm doing because I want to read something to you guys, and. Uh, It's such a light sketch. Okay. Oh, there's another hack uh, with, with drawing, and that's that if you're just doing a line drawing, you could use a heavier line where there's a shading area on your specimen. And a very light line where there's a highlight. So sometimes that's a, just a little trick that uh, can give depth to your drawing if you want to. Everything is if you want to. That's what I love about it. There's no right way to do it. Although if you go on like a, a journal, nature journaling Facebook page, um, I've, heard, I've heard some people go like incredibly depressed after they see all these professional artists and you know, you could take a lot of time on it, and um, it's a it's a wonderful thing. It's just, you know, not everybody's going to be wanting to to do that. So yeah, I always uh, with the kids especially remind them that it's not a competition. 
this is you. Everybody has their own play on it. Um, and we do like to share. We, we definitely like to share. The kid who did that turkey thing thought it was hysterical. Look what I did. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Where was that? Where was that on the trail? I didn't see that. And then all these like body parts. So if you, the thing is, if you are drawing from a photograph, photographs can be tricky. Um, you know, shadows can give you an illusion of something that is or not, is not there. Um, so if you, if you're stuck with just doing from, you know, from a, picture um look at a lot of pictures you know look at them from different angles and you know they'll inform you about the science of your uh subject yes yeah, it's, it's like that fringe loose strife um it took me a while to figure out that i needed to reverse that flower because i couldn't see the the stigma i couldn't see the Pistols didn't occur to me to just turn the flower around until till later. Maybe it's because I was having too much fun at camp with all the fellow master naturalists. We should do that again. All right. There we go. So if you if you make a whoopsie, just pick up your pencil and keep going. Let me a whoopsie here. Um, yeah, and then you'll figure it out. Like, okay, that's where that one goes. Is everybody talking to themselves? You're supposed to be doing that, right? I have a lot of negative self-talk happening right now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, then there's a then there's a time when you just throw in the towel and start <laughs> again. Yeah. I, I want something like that looks like an alien. <laughs> it does look like an alien, doesn't it? I should go get the creature. You know, I didn't I didn't name her on purpose because I don't know, it's just she's gonna die. But they they definitely look super alien. Okay, so I'm gonna read to you folks because she's so lovely. And um oh yeah, yeah, and, and also consider you know what they're on. You know, what are they what are they walking on? Is it a because that can inform you about the environment. Uh, maybe that's why you don't see that hind leg. Because it's, uh, oh, and also it gives you another thing about negative space. And I see now what happened here because, uh -huh. that's why I don't see the back legs because the cloth is covering them up. Good job. That makes sense now. I'll tell you though, I think it would be horrifying to see one of these like eating a hummingbird. I agree. Yeah, send it back to China. Of course, my questions are like, where in China? Like, how, you know, are they? You know, are they destructive there? Or do they have a special niche that maybe we don't realize? Mm. Uh, so this quote is from Lao Tzu's. 
Just remain in the center, watching, and then forget that you are there. I think sometimes when we're drawing like that, we get into the zone. You know, time disappears, and all of a sudden you look up and it's midnight. It's not midnight yet. Oh, this one is by Stephen Jay Gould. Let our minds play with ideas. Let our senses gather information and let the rich interaction proceed as it must. For the mind possesses what the senses gather, while a disembodied brain devoid of all external input would be a sorry instrument indeed. That was from this book here. I don't know if you look at it in focus. Uh, uh, uh. Anyway, it's Nature a Day at a, at a Time, an Uncommon Look at Common Wildlife by Kathy Katz. So it's full, you know, of beautiful illustrations and text. Day by day, she talks about something different. And then she has, you know, these quotes on the bottom. That was a gift uh, from a friend of mine. All right. I think, huh, I'm still looking at that green thing. Oh my goodness. All right, you guys ready? Q&A? Sure. All right. So we'll keep it up. Oops, share your sketches. Let me just go back a minute. We'll keep it up. There. Hey, you gotta hold up your, your sketch to the screen. <laughs> All right, ready? Do we have everybody? Uh, how many people do we have? Show everybody. Wow. Are they are they coming? Can everybody see everybody's? Mine looks kind of foggy. They're beautiful. Wow. These are frameable things, folks. <laughs> oh, that's so great. That's so great. You guys are rock. All right. So let's um let's have a little chat. We don't have much time, do we? Uh, no. Oh, it's, it's already eight o'clock. Holy cow. See see what I mean? Time just like flies by. Um, well, I hope everybody enjoyed yourselves. And but before we go, uh, I posed some questions because I didn't know the answers to them, and wondering if anybody has input into any of the things I talked about. Marine, you mean any kind of questions at all? Any questions at all? Because this is an information sharing session. My only question, I think you sort of answered it, was that what's the role of photography? Because I know when I get drawing like this, I'll sit there and just draw and draw and draw. And, I'll, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, an hour will go, have gone by and I've missed a lot of other things. And so I tend to be a little bit more impatient. Whereas mm -hmm. a, with a, photo a photograph, I mean, I can do a lot of photography and pick up a lot of things along the way. And then maybe we'll have time to go back and draw them or journal afterwards. So I, I find yeah, that... And, and the I find that my busy, busy life, especially when I'm outdoors, I just rarely have or take the time anyway to sit down and to do the drawing part of it. It just takes a lot of time. Probably it would be better if I did, but. Yeah, and it's just like, well, what, what makes a habit, right? It's like doing it how many days or whatever. I forgot the metrics on that. Um, but it can become a habit, even if it's just a few words. And no sketches, you know, um, you know, over time people to, you know, they make uh, diaries, whatever, but, um, you know, just, just keeping a little book and keeping it handy. You know, mine's really small. I, you know, I, I don't want to do a big thing. I want to be able to throw this in my backpack and just like, you know, throw a few um, notes on there, maybe a sketch, maybe take a picture. Um, you're right, though, Steve. I mean, getting back and actually doing it when life, 
you know, greets you at the door with all these other demands. Uh, yeah. And, and so I'm a bit lucky because I re- I, I'm a retired teacher. I have more time now, um, even though I've got a, you know, you know, the nature center gig and subbing and all that. Um, but I, I try to make it because I want to be um I want to, I want to model when I'm teaching the kids, right? So if my if my <laughs> if my notebook is totally blank, it's like loser, you know, you can't do anything. <laughs> so uh, I, I just try every now and again. But yeah, like during that hike, I mean, my husband's like, click, 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 click we're going. You know, um, I remember I took a bicycle ride from Philadelphia to Kentucky when I was in my early 20s. I went with another woman. She was a photographer. I brought all my paints. And it was like, as soon as I set up to paint a landscape, she was like, I'm done. Let's go. So so we wound up actually splitting and it got really scary around Appalachia, you know, like, da, 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 da. I mean, it was like really like coal trucks and stuff. That was that was kind of scary. But yeah, I mean, uh, it has to be on your own schedule. Yeah. But yeah, make it a little make it a little habit. Keep it with you. And you tr- throw it in your truck. Um you never know when you're going to see that eagle come right up over the hill and like knock your senses loose. Uh, it happens. So just have it have it handy. You don't have to write it in every day. It doesn't, you know, who's saying you have to, right? Yep. It's our thing. Yeah. So I hope we, we learned something about the praying mantis, right? I didn't know that they were invasive. Holy cow. Did you know that, Chrissy? Um, I think. Probably I think knew. I remember Cole mentioning that maybe during the the insect session, but yeah, um, yeah. But I, it's still good to to hear it again. Yeah. So I'm not gonna. I had I had never seen pictures of them. Yeah, I'm not gonna go on my knees and worship them anymore. That's for sure. 